Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, this morning I want to talk about Oman recent history. Well, a little bit more so. Pretend it's kind of dusky. You know, come hither, okay, rather than just close. So, um, I think yesterday was a really interesting look. It was a brief look at Salala. Whether you were on the archaeological tour or the city tour, it gave you a sense of how very different this country is from any other Arab country you may have visited. From pulling into the port, which was of course very, very busy, but so orderly, so clean, everything was just so. Very little security to be seen anywhere, uh, not a spe speck of litter on the streets, a lot of development, unlike the other countries we've been in. When they built something, they finished it. You know, big difference there. Um, and a lot of other things that just made this a very, very different sort of experience. So Oman is very much its own country, developed in a very different way than did other countries in this region. Going back to the to early, early history, Oman was very distinguished, it was one of the first parts of the Arabian Peninsula to convert to Islam in 630, so very, very early. Um, a lot of problems economically, up and down, up and down in the 12th and 14th centuries, a lot of economic downturn. Again, as the overland routes for the incense, this is Dofar province where we were yesterday, D-H-O-F-A-R. Dofar is an important site in the frankincense routes. So of course, most of this overland trade collapses in favor of the, of the water routes, which is a big problem for the economy of Oman. But Oman continued to be a land of seafarers. As I mentioned, Vasco de Gama had an Omani navigator. The Omanis were very, very prominent navigators and uh, seamen. And um, again, the Portuguese had a major stake in Oman because to protect their uh, colonies, their factories, on the west coast of India. So Francesco de Albuquerque, shown here, who also established a number, number of colonies in the West Indies, you may know in that context, visited Sur, which is south of Muscat, and uh, established a series of forts. And uh, so the Portuguese really had a large presence in Oman for over 150 years. And if you go to Muscat, you can still see on either side of the, the major uh, harbor these huge Portuguese forts that were built in the 16th century, Jalali and Narani. Oman was very much caught in European rivalries for the Indian Ocean. So the Ottomans rise, they try to uh, expel the Portuguese, and so yet, yet Oman was kind of buffered back and forth depending on which European power wanted control over that part of the Arabian Peninsula. The thing that was very important for Omani history is um, we see, again, the geography of the country where we've got um, the fertile area here and then another fertile area around Salala. And this leads to a very big division between the very coastal area, which looks toward the sea, and the highlands that don't go very far to this area, which look more to, um, they're, they're more insular. They're not so interested in the sea. You can see this actually dividing Oman into several different spheres of influence. By the 17th century, uh, there was a power shift, and the country essentially splits into two. So you've got Imams that rule along the coast, and rival sultans, excuse me, the, the sultans are on the coast, and the Imams are on the interior. So you really have two different power groups in Oman at this time. Oman developed one of the largest non-European seagoing fleets in the Indian Ocean. It entered into lots of alliances with the British East India Company, and it started to allow the British to build factories, so-called factories, at uh, Sohar. And so from this period, we start seeing the construction of these enormous forts. And this is the most typical architecture of Oman. If you want to say, what is Omani architecture? You're going to look at these forts, and they're spotted all over the country. Many of these are very old, but they look like they're brand new out of the box because the Omanis use these. So this is kind of interesting thing for preservationists because we'd say, well, they all look new. Why are you over restoring them? But these actually are functional within the villages because the majlis, the local consultative councils, are established in these local forts. So if you're going to the office, you want to work in a crummy office. So it's, a, it's an odd disconnect. This is the fort at Barca, right on the and beautiful, fabulous architecture, very, very distinctive. Uh, here, Nizwa Fort in the interior, these enormous um, towers. 
Again, uh, this is uh, 17th century. 18th century has been heavily restored. And over the years going here, it's interesting because you see one fort that looks very romantic, kind of a crumbling ruin, and the next time I go, it's like, it's been completely redone. That's it. Or here, uh, Knockle uh, Fortress in the interior. This one, in fact, so has uh, scaffoldings all over it as they're redoing it. But so the entire coast and slight interior area of Oman are covered with these fortresses, which is an indication of defense against European powers on the sea, but also this rivalry between the Sultan on the coast and the Imam in the interior. By about 1730, Zanzibar, on the coast of Africa, was added to the empire. Um, and we see increasingly this division of Oman into the coastal area and the, and the um, highlands area, a division that really lasted in the 20th century. The Omanis were quite clever. They tended to pay, play the British and French off against each other for domination of the Indian Ocean. Um, but by the 1800s, British established a very, very strong presence in Muscat, which really persisted pretty much down until today. As uh, I already mentioned, uh, Sultan Qaboos was trained in Sandhurst. Even his father was trained. He was trained in, in the Anglo-English schools. But the Omanis have always looked very strongly to the British, but trying to keep them at hand's length, yet using what the British, what the British can do for them. The Omanis have always been rather outward-looking, progressive. Oman was the second Arab country in the world to recognize the United States in 1833. And in 1840, it was quite a hubbub in Washington when Sultan Sayyid sent the first Arab delegation to the United States, sending uh, Martin Van Buren Arabian horses and a special sword. But as early as the 1840s, we see another pattern beginning, which is a lot of friction with what is becoming the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia particularly over this area in northern Oman. As I mentioned, o Oman is not contiguous up to the Masandu Peninsula. There is now part of the UAE, the Emirates is in this area, but there was a lot of conflict with Saudi Arabia over the exact borders, and until recent years, many of these borders were just dashed in, was they were undetermined borders. The major point of contention is right up here, the Bahraini Oasis which I mentioned this in context with archaeology, because archaeologically it's a very important site. But as we'll see, it's a big problem because it's also a major oil site. So that leads to even more contention. So as I mentioned, uh, the expansion to Zanzibar, and by 1830, Sultan Said actually established Zanzibar as the second capital. So this time we have two capitals, in Muscat and in Zanzibar. And at that time, Oman was called the Kingdom of Muscat and Zanzibar. This was partially because of trade, and part of the trade was not so very nice, which is, oh, first of all, I loved this yesterday. We pulled into port, and I thought, oh, shouldn't be a surprise if there's a ship from Zanzibar in Salala. It used to be part of their kingdom. Um, but a lot of the trade was very shameful, a big African slave trade, because when you think, when you see photographs of, um, like old photographs or even modern photographs of Saudi Arabia, a lot of the temple staff were African slaves who were brought in. And so even today, Arabs have a wide variety of complexions because there was a lot of slaving coming through the Omanis from Zanzibar into the Arabian Peninsula. <coughs> they were also trading in wood. Uh, in the UK banned slavery, uh, transport of slaves in, in 1811. There was a treaty in 1833. But Oman only agreed to stop slaving in 1845. In the 19th century, there were more problems. Uh, Sultan Said died in 1865, and there was a big problem in succession. The kingdom was partitioned between his two sons, Thelani, who ruled in Muscat, and Majid, who ruled in Zanzibar. So they're really very much divided with the kingdom north and south at this time. And at this point, we still have problems with the Wahhabis, the early Saudi Arabians, over the Bahraini Oasis. And again, a decline in economy as steamships take over the trade. Of course, the opening of the Suez Canal was disastrous for Oman because ships were just bypassing Oman on their way to India and further to the east. And the, the, the trade in, in the Arabian Gulf, Persian Gulf, depends on how you want to call it, um, also declined tremendously during this period, leaving Oman 
pretty much of an economic backwater. So much so that the population of Muscat over 20 years dropped from 55,000 to 8,000 people. It became just a complete backwater. This forced Oman into a closer relationship with the British. So by 1877, got some great old photographs. This is not 1877, obviously, but it's close. Imam, Imam Turkey, who is the ruler in the interior, asked the British for help against his rivals along the coast because Imam Turkey wanted to attack the Sultan in Muscat. So there's, as you can see, the beginning is basically a civil war going on here. In return, the British forced a treaty of exclusive trade so the Omanis could only trade with British. So the British envoy became the de facto ruler of Muscat as a way of protecting the Sultan in Muscat. In the 20th century, um, the country was ruled by Sultan Taimur, who's the grandfather of Kabus. This is uh, Taimur in the back, and a little more flattering picture of him here, Sultan Taimur. Taimur was on the throne from 1913, and he was forced to abdicate in 1932, which is kind of interesting, and he was exiled off to Japan for the rest of his life. Um, so things were clearly not going very smoothly in, uh, in Oman. By 1920, there was a, a treaty that officially divided the country between Muscat and Oman. So again, this dichotomy of the coast and the inland, they actually divided it into two separate countries at that time. Uh, Taimur, pretty handsome guy. Taimur, shown here, as I said, was, I abdicated in 1932. He was succeeded by his son, Sayyid. This is Sayyid. Looks like a pretty friendly guy in this picture. Um, he ruled from 1932 to 1970. And this was, a, toward the end of his reign, was a very, very tough place, time in Arabia. You have to think about what's going on in the 60s, the 50s and 60s. Um, Marxist ideologies, the Iron Curtain, Cold War, all of this was being played out in Arabia as well. Um, in the late 60s and 70s, there was this terrible civil war going on next door in Yemen between uh, the Marxist ideologues against the royalists, and it actually turned out to be a proxy war between the Saudi royal family who was supporting the royal family in Oman, Yemen, and the um, the Republicans were supported by Egypt. We didn't get much of this in the press, but this was a terrible, terrible war. There was napalm, terrible, hundreds and hundreds, of thousands of people being killed. But again, it was a proxy war. The, the Yemenis, the quote was, uh, the Yemenis are royalists in the morning and Republicans in the afternoon. And so the Yemenis just sort of stepped back. Um, Yemen, or that part of the Arabian Peninsula, became, became known as the uh, graveyard of the Egyptians. This was a terrible time. The Egyptian young men who were being called up for military service were being shipped off to Yemen, where it was like they didn't come back. It was terrible. So we see that sort of growing problem around the whole rim of the Arabian Peninsula, and it becomes a big problem in Oman as well. And part of this is uh, these royal families, of course, want to hold on to their power. You have Marxist groups coming in. And of course, the reaction of the West is clearly domino theory. You know, if, if Arabian Peninsula falls to the Marxists, it means no oil for the West. So this was an international concern that was going on. Syed Taimur, again, the, the father of Qaboos, um, in response to all of this, there was a complete backlash against Western influence in Oman, a rejection of everything European. Uh, he, is, he is quoted as saying, the people shall have not what they want, but what I think is good for them. A very uh, important book by Fred Halliday, who's a Marxist uh, theologian, uh, uh, ideologue, but um, the, his, his book is kind of out of date, but it's inter interesting. It's called Arabia Without Sultans. Fred Halliday describes Said as, quote, one of the nastiest rulers the world has seen in a long time. There was no, no electricity, no roads, no radio, no eyeglasses, books, cigarettes. This is until 1970, is what's going on in Yemen. 
And there are a whole bunch of books written about this, especially when their diplomats would come. Often they or their wives would write a, write a book. And all of these books have titles like Where Time Stood Still, or you know, The Land That Time Forgot, or you know, Hidden Arabia, or Mysterious Arabia, because it was just this bizarre time going on. Um, just next door in Yemen, the RAF came in to try to restore order, and there were all these bombing raids, uh, some really interesting literature written about this time, which also, with the chronological distance we have on it now, is fascinating about how the West is looking at this rise of Marxism in the Middle East and what it meant for, of course, petroleum. During this period, life was really, really tough in Oman. There was only one paved road between Muscat and Mutra, very short segment by the capital. The attitude of Sultan Said's attitude to education was summed up by his statement to the British. This is why you lost India, because you educated the people. Hmm. And so his theory is to close all the schools. He closed the three remaining schools in Oman, branding them breeding grounds for communism. Many of Said's uh, over-the-top actions were motivated by a completely ruined economy. And as a result of that, he had an obsession with not spending money on the country and infrastructure. He reasoned that creating infrastructure would place Oman even further under British control, as he had seen happen in Egypt, Aden, India, other places in, in Africa. This guy was no fool, but it wasn't perhaps the greatest re reaction to all of this. So what happens next is oil. Um, Oil is discovered in Oman in 1967. By 1954, beforehand, of course, the development of the oil fields in Arabia. 1950, Aramco, the American Arab uh, Consortium, in partnership, uh, well, Aramco, which is a partnership of the US and, and the Saudi Arabia, began drilling in Bahraini Oasis, which, as you know, the ownership of that was completely disputed. The, the Saudis are saying, it's ours, we're drilling there, and we're taking the oil out of Bahraini. Um, this was not well received, and it starts pitting actually Americans who are in, um, of course, part of Aramco, drilling with the Saudis against the British, who are protecting the Omani interests. And so we start having the British and Americans having conflict over who is taking the oil out of Bahraini, because both the British and, of course, the Americans, we are not disinterested parties in what's happening with the oil fields in Arabia. This also created more problems about who controlled the coast of Oman. Um, Sultan Said allowed the PDO, which is the Petroleum Development uh, Corporation of Oman, which was associated with Royal Dutch Shell, to drill under Ibri. Uh, Ibri is a site which is under in, inland, which is under the Imam's control. So we've got the Sultan stealing oil from the Imam so we've got all of this discord as people are starting to uh, develop the oil fields. In 1954, Saudi Arabia actually attacks Oman uh, about the oil fields in Barami. In 1955-1960, Sultan Said's British-backed arm army fought the forces of the Imam, so again, this coastal versus inland conflict. Um, and at that point, they're actually allied by the RAF bombers who were stationed in Yemen. So it's basically a, a huge international problem, which, again, didn't make it into the American press very much. We had other concerns with the spread of communism, communism in Asia and Europe. By 1963, tribal forces in Dofar, where we were yesterday, Dofar province, attacked uh, the, the palace in Salalah. Uh, Sultan Said and his son Qaboos, the whole family is from Salala, where we were, so they've always maintained palaces there. So in 1963, tribal groups attacked the palace in Salala. And this is really, really great because, you know, Marxist ideology, remember like all the acronyms people had, well, like the SLA and all this kind of stuff. So you've got PFLOG, which is the uh, Dofar Liberation Front these sort of things. So Go, go for the Liberation Front tries to assassinate Sultan Said, and Said called upon the British with a message. This is, this is a classic in Omani history. He's cabling to the British and, we seem to be having a little trouble down at the palace, and I wonder if you'd be so good to come down. 
<laughs> and that little trouble evolved into a 12 year civil war in Oman. Just this terrible, terrible civil war as a result of a little trouble down for Dallas. So um, the Dofar Liberation Front was renamed um, the liberation of the occupied Arab Gulf of these very strong names, uh, also called PFLOG in the 1960s. A period of a lot of spread of communism and Marxism in Arabia. If you think about Yemen, Djibouti, you think about the Aswan High Dam project, remember that was going to be an American project in the 60s and we wouldn't give the Egyptians the money, so they turned to Russia to get the money. And of course Washington was just like, oh my god, uh, now we have Russians in, in, uh, in Egypt. So it was a very, and also Iraq went uh, Marxist, and South Yemen, of course, very, very strong Marxist state. And so this was a big international problem. The Sultan's troops were primarily British and also drawn from Jordan and Iran. Again, this whole civil war in Thofar is not very well known in the West because Syed controlled visas and the press. And the press had very limited access to Oman and information about the Thofar war. This is the same, this incredible uh, civil war being fought at the same time in Yemen, which is extremely interesting stuff, because a few journalists did get in and followed that. And again, it was not known because in just like Sultan Saeed, the Imam in Yemen personally gave the visas, and they weren't giving visas to people, so Westerners were not allowed to come in. So let's go forward to Sultan Qaboos, the uh, current Sultan. He was born in 1940. So he's of our generation, certainly. British education. Um, as I mentioned, his father, Sayyid, was, was educated in the Anglo schools in, in India, but he actually sent Kamus to, to uh, the UK itself, to Sandhurst. And Kamus actually served with European troops in Europe. So he has a and he has real military background. He returned to Oman in 1964 and was held basically um, prisoner in the palace. Well, his father was trying to sort out what was going on, and of course he, he didn't really trust his son to advise him with what was going on in Oman at this point. So in 1970, Qaboos, uh, with a lot of backing, uh, forced his father to abdicate. It was a, a bloodless coup. His father was pushed off the throne, and Qaboos took over. And it is unbelievable to think about what he has been able to do in 25, is it 35 years? In only 35 years. Is that my math right? 25, 30, 40, 40, 40. Uh, 45 years. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's absolutely incredible what this guy was able to do in Oman. Uh, he spent the oil ro revenue on roads, schools, education of boys as well as girls, as we could see when we were in Salala. As you know, he is an absolute ruler. He was referred to as His Majesty. He is a complete micromanager of the country, which the Yamanis seem to appreciate. I'm not sure if it's as prevalent now as it was a few years ago, but as I mentioned to the East, even okay, like the decor of the big hotels in Muscat. Qaboos and Oman are very staunch allies of the US. They, are, they were supporters of the United States in the Gulf War and have allowed uh, US troops to use Oman as staging areas. The government since 1990, <coughs> There's Kaboos in his more mature phase. Uh, the palace is the uh, Casa al Adam in Muscat. Um, this is kind of Kaboos modern the architecture. It's the, the, the modern architecture in Oman is really interesting because it's kind of kind of Arabian Disneyland Java. <laughs> and uh, but this is a spectacular thing. It's like it's a, it's certainly a one-off, and Kaboos is very involved and the designs of this stuff. So since 1990, um, he of course is an absolute monarch, but he is advised by an 80 member majlis. Majlis is a traditional name, which means a gathering of, uh, of people in authority. So there are majlises in each of the districts who deal with local things. They bring matters forward to Muscat, and then there's a bigger majlis where they look at these issues and uh, things are decided between them and the Sultan. The president of the major majlis is appointed by Qaboos. Women got the vote in 1994, which is quite extraordinary, and there are women in the majlis and women administrators and um, heads of departments of state. 
a major problem in Oman is the economy because the reliance upon foreign workers, and this was pretty obvious yesterday. You can see that so many of the workers in all the shops, the guys sweeping the streets, huge percentage of people are not Omanis. And as we heard, there's something like only three and a half million Omanis in Oman. It's a very, very small population. And so they, like some other countries in this area, are really relying upon foreign workers. Uh, I can see a big difference from this visit to previous visits. It used to be impossible to get an Omani tour guide. They would not do it. They were not interested in it. You couldn't do it. So it was really weird. You'd bring groups here to hear about Oman, and the guides were all uh, very well-intentioned and well-trained people from India. And it's like, that's not what you really want to, you know, even if they know what they're talking about, it's just not the same as talking to an Omani. And so I was really pleased to see that at least they've got the tour guides in the program now. Um, about 15 years ago, there was a very strong Omanification program here um, under Kabus. Again, this idea of trying to get Omanis into the ethic of work, making them realize they can do different sectors than just the civil service, give pride in the idea of work. But you can see it's difficult with such a small population. That's why they have these, um, these wardrobe laws. Only Omanis can wear the dishdasha. That long robe with the perfume tassel. Did you notice the tassel around the neck? That's for perfume. It's a lot older from the days when everything was stinky. I mean, perfume. So it is illegal for anyone then, an Omani, to wear that. Uh, so what they're doing is very carefully, I mean, not suddenly at all, making sure you know who's an Omani and who's not an Omani. Also, any Omani on government business, they have to wear that. They cannot wear a business suit. They have to wear that as a way of uh, reinforcing Oman, Omani identity. And, it's, and it's, it's great, because you cannot mistake these guys for somebody from the Gulf. You cannot mistake them for somebody from Saudi Arabia because of the tassel. So there's a different version in, in uh, UAE, but, but especially the headgear. These are the only guys that wear the kufa, the cool little embroidered hats, the floral hats. And then on, on when they're on really big business, they have to wear the cashmere shawl around it, much like you see with Kabus. But Kabus has a different color that you can wear. So, can, can someone fool someone and just dress in an Omani like an Omani? I suppose somebody could fool people and dress like an Omani, but I don't know what the consequences are. I don't know. But it's it's again this idea they want to keep their identity and not get mixed in with the Emirates or Yemen, or Saudi Arabia. Yeah, what about, is there ever mixed marriage? Are there mixed marriages? No. No, I think it's, I think it's illegal for an Omani to, to marry. I don't think an Omani woman can marry anybody than an Omani. I think, well, I think, yes, I, it's possible for an Omani man to marry a foreigner. But Omani women have to marry Omanis because they're the one that, ones that have to give birth. So it's sort of, you know, sort of makes sense that they're doing these. And uh, more examples of Kabus uh, Modern. This is the uh, the Kabus uh, Mosque in Muscat. Again, very different influences. And here are pictures of men in Omani garb. So here, very, very distinctive with these uh, kufa, the little hats. And in certain seasons, they wear different color dishdasha, as they're called. But on official business, they have to wear kind of the, the tan. A light tan dishdasha is the, is the required color. The government might be said to be enlightened totalitarianism. And Kabus does what Kabus wants to do, and luckily, he's a pretty smart guy. Pretty smart guy. Women serve in the army and the police, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, the, the state has a protected, I think this is still current, six month maternity leave. Uh, there's state sponsorship of the orchestra. Oman is very, very proud of its orchestra, which is a Western-style orchestra. There's a lot of funding for kids' music, classical music programs. And, and the Omani orchestra tours around the Middle East and has been elsewhere. Uh, lots of programs for the disabled, which you don't see in other parts of the Middle East. As the guide said, there is free education. Uh, up to college. In 1970, there was only one private school for girls and three schools for boys. 
1997, the most current stats that I have, um, excuse me, 1995, there were a thousand schools for boys and girls throughout the country. And as one of our guides mentioned, even in the smallest villages, they're going to have a school because education is a major, major priority of Kabuz. By grade five, they're, they're separated by gender. So little boys and girls go to school together, they're separated, and then in college, they will often go to the same classes, but sometimes on opposite sides of the road. Unlike Saudi Arabia, where the girls and boys never mix, even in universities, it's really odd. But with all of this sort of good news about Kabus, it is still a very traditional society, as you can see. For example, here, uh, men, this is up by Nizwa, the Bukhid Market. You know, this looks sort of like the age of the patriarchs with uh, embroidered hats. So it is still, especially the further you get out of Muscat, it gets very, very conservative. It's very difficult to uh, obtain a divorce. Multiple wives are allowed, but rare. Uh, a thing that I love is the beautification projects. It's just hilarious. And when you're driving around places like Muscat, um, if you see like a hillock, there'll be like plaster oryxes on them. Um, Stuff and I, you saw some of the roundabouts in Salala with um, different types of sculptures on them and stuff. So it's part of the beautification project. And so Salala, where we were yesterday, of course, is right down here. And I wanted to show you this is a wonderful topographic map. So this is so we were down in here, and that you can see this coastal area and then these big cliffs that where it rises up to the uh, plain of the empty quarter. So that's why this is a very unique uh, environmental cli climate area. This is what it looks like once you get out of Salala, some of the most rugged terrain in the world. Absolutely incredible. This is on the way west to Yemen. In the 80s, the Omanis built the most expensive highway in the world, at least at that time. And gee, as I mentioned to some of you, the contractor was the uh, son of Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. But absolutely incredible. And so this was a, a, a project to do a road between Oman and Yemen. And you can see why they, there wasn't a lot of contact before, because this is really, really rough terrain. And going back to the natural history of this area, of course, the frankincense trees that we looked at before, and now you've seen these frankincense shops. This is the shop we were in yesterday and the variety of the burners and all the doodads you can buy for frankincense. Um, some of us also saw the dry cleaning shop where they use, for dry cleaning, they put usually frames. Uh, they put the clothing over and you put an incense burner underneath it to fumigate it and make, make it splits. Other things that I noticed this time, this is the souk years ago and it looks pretty much like it looked yesterday. Mm -hmm. But I did see some interesting new things. Lots and lots of telecom, more signs in English, or English in Arabic. And it, this is this is great. You know, this is so classic Oman. So you got the guy playing the oud, and he's got his little you know his cashmere shawl on. You know, it's getting no no question this guy's Oman. But some other things that were hilarious. You got the real store. Everything one real. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different kind of marketing. One. It's the um, store. But a thing we didn't see, because we didn't get into the gold soup, is a, a very important product of Fofar. And the tradition, there's a different marriage tradition in Fofar. Throughout the country, if you're going to marry a woman, you have to bring a lot of money to the table. It's, of course, the dowry. And the easiest way to amass this money is gold jewelry. And so in Fofar, and I'm sure they still do this, but I didn't see it myself, these bizarre wedding crowns. They wear these... The, what, the bride wears these at the, at the wedding, but this is basically bullion. She's not going to wear this on a day-to-day -day basis. Basically, you load the, your to-be bride down with tons and tons of gold, as much gold as you can afford, which is why you have these gold suits with these just crazy things. You're not going to wear them. That is basically the dowry that gets put away, including lots and lots of bangle bracelets. So that's the reason why when you go into these gold suits, really in any country in the Middle East, you see so many gold bangles because those are incremental um, investments to the wife's security. And then just a couple slides of Musandam, where we'll be day after tomorrow, 
yeah, after tomorrow. So we're going to be coming, here's Musk at the Capitol coming up, and here is um, this section that's the UAE. We used to have, have to get like multiple entry visas, which was weird, to cross here and then go back to Oman. This area is absolutely spectacular. And it's described in the sales information as, you know, like Norway, and it is Norway with guys in skirts. It's, it's really, it's really spectacular. And these are slides that, you know, and it wasn't a great day, but it was there. So you can expect some beautiful, beautiful photography, beautiful vistas, little towns. It's really a fabulous, fabulous experience. This is right on the Straits of Hormuz. On a clear day, you can see Iran and watch for the boats going back, usually going to Iran, they're full of goats and sheep, and coming back, they're full of cigarettes. But we'll see if they're clamping down on it. Well, the first time I was in Musandam, um, it was cell phones, of course there were cell phones in the United States, and good ones, but I, when I was in Musandam, I saw cell phones that were like 15 years in advance of what was going on in the United States. It was really interesting. Another thing to watch for, and I don't know if they still do this, but well-dressed men in Musandam, instead of carrying like a, a cane or an umbrella, they carry these little hatchets. It's like a wood a wood uh, staff, maybe two feet long, and a very beautiful little silver miniature hatchet head on it. And I don't remember the name of an Arabic, but I was asking the guy who was dealing with this, what is that? And he said, well, every well-dressed man, every well-dressed man carries this. And he said, but you know, it's really a problem. You go to a restaurant and you leave it, you know, and you just forget where you got it. So but it'll be interesting to see if those are still around or if those have gone the way of, of a dodo. A couple other comments about um, Kabus. Um, we had different comments from our guides, and uh, uh, Sophia was my shill. I was asking her, like, hey, so ask a question about this. And um, so, yeah, who's going to succeed? And something that I was not, that I had not heard before, and I think other people in other buses heard this, which I thought was extremely interesting. Um, first of all, you probably heard that Kabus had been ill, and he's been in Germany for like four, four, four months. Yes. Wow, four months. And he's okay. He's okay. He had some tests. And stuff. they're celebrating. And they're celebrating. And they also had National Day while he was gone, which was really tough for them to not have him here, which is the, the tacky scarf that Bob and I both bought. The, the shawl with couples from National Day. Um, so uh, the succession, as you know, he has no heir. And what we were told is Kabus has designated an heir, and that name is sealed in an envelope. Oh, okay, well, I think we're getting different versions of this. Okay, so in any case, he is named a successor. And then when he dies, the Majlis, the head of the Majlis, they have three days, is what we were told, three days to decide amongst them who is going to be the successor. If they're deadlocked, they open Kabus's envelope, and that's who the next person is. Is that pretty much what other people heard? Yeah. Yeah. Which is extraordinary. A really interesting combination of, of a dynasty but a dynasty with a little bit of um, consultation, almost demo you know, democracy thrown in. It's, it's a, it, it, Oman is truly a one-off state. There's nothing, nothing like it. Um, other questions or comments? How about things that you so, yeah. well, We're told that uh, Oman is one of the most conservative uh, Islamic uh, religions. <laughs> I would agree with that. <laughs> and, and, and then we observed that it's got one of the most progressive societies in the region. Is there no conflict? It's a very good question. Um, very uh, very traditional religion and a progressive society. Well, you see, you saw it. It seems, at least, at least the snippet that we saw, it seems to work because in Oman, first of all, the the form of Islam in, in, in Oman is uh, the Badi Shiism, which sounds like, oh my gosh, it's, but there's a lot of give and take. I mean, they're very pious people, but they're not, um, they're more reserved. It's not like the Saudis where they're pushing their interpretation of religion on other people. It is a very conservative society, but there's something it might have to do with the personality of Kabus, that Kabus is able to, to carry this off. Now, Omani Islam looks like a, a walk in the park compared with, for example, Saudi Arabia, where there, you know, the, the nice thing about Oman is 
they let civil um, the society develop in certain ways, certain conservative ways, but they have the religion over here. And they do, of course, intersect. But of course, what we see in Saudi Arabia is they are completely fused. And that's where it gets very uh, difficult for, I think, people from the West to understand because it just doesn't seem to work for us. But it's, it's a very good point to make. Yeah, yeah, I, I actually asked our guide yesterday when we were in the, the Mosque of the Sultan um, if it was a body because it looked like Sunni mosques. And he said, no, we are Sunni here. They are a body in Muscat. That's very interesting. Okay. And I did not realize they were divided. Not, okay, so so Ross asked somebody, and they are Sunni in the south in Salala, and they're a body uh, Shiite along the coast. I did not know that. Interesting. Yeah. What's the difference between an imam and a sultan? What's the difference between an imam and a sultan? Technically, an imam is more of a religious ruler that he is that he's at the head of the community of the faithful. He will often lead the prayers. A sultan can be that, but a sultan is usually more of a political figure. But in Oman, the Oman, the Oman, Imam and the sultan who were battling each other basically had the same powers, they just had different titles. But in other countries, usually sultan is more of a political figure, although he has religious underpinning, and Imam may have limited political power, but much more religious. about women's clothing in Amman. Um, it's hard, I don't know a lot about women's clothing in Oman because I see them with their abayas on and it, it's not a society where I have been invited. But women are very, very reserved, which is why it's kind of cool to see that woman running a front as that stall. Um, as, the, as you can see, they're wearing the cap, the face mask, which comes in a lot of different varieties. But Omani women generally are pretty well covered up. I, I don't know enough to, about women's clothing to really say. So. Yeah, um, Al. Uh, Maureen asked me to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Maureen asked me to ask you if Omani women are allowed to wear hijabs in the gold. If if an Omani woman gets a divorce, who gets the gold? Usually, as I understand it, the woman keeps most of it. That's her security. That's why she has the gold. Because if she gets divorced, she's not going to be. She doesn't have a man to support her. But as I said, it's difficult to get a divorce in Oman. But that's the whole idea with with all that gold is it's for security. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the different complexions going back to the slave trade. It's often said that East African trade was a little less onerous because if you converted to Dick, Islam. I'd like to give you the microphone because I'd like you to say a few words about the East African slave trade with Zanzibar. Can't, would you be willing? Uh, oh, here. This guy's an expert. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I'm not. Uh, and the, what, what I want, you mentioned the different complexions that result from that history of slave trade. But I wondered whether those are reflected in different levels in society as in discrimination. Uh, on the other hand, I've heard that East African slave trade was less onerous because if people converted to Islam, then they assumed rights and they could be integrated in society. And I wondered if you'd comment on whether that's true in Oman or any of the other uh, similar states. As far as I know, the East, well, the slaves that were traded into Oman and then into Central <coughs> Arabia, into Arabia. It's not a plantation system. It's not an agricultural system. And so most, a lot of these slaves, slaves were used in households and palaces, that sort of thing. So first of all, the, um, as I understand it, the, the labor was not as terrible as the plantation system. Um, yes, they could convert. And you think about, um, you think about like the black eunuchs in the Ottoman court. These are people probably from East Africa who come up, they've converted, and they're at the very highest echelon of the government. Um, so there are 
I don't know a lot about it, so I don't want to speculate, but there is color prejudice. There absolutely is color prejudice all over the Arabian Peninsula. The lighter your complexion, the more refined you are thought to be. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> Questions about burials in the Middle East, um, really no mention of them. It, the burial practices in this area vary tremendously depending on their interpretation of the Quran. Uh, first of all, the overall idea is once you're gone, you're gone. Because as you might know, in, in Muslim societies, your body is washed. It's, it, it, the, the day you die, you're washed. They're usually with these little mosques, they're little square buildings next to them, and those are, the, those are the places where they wash the dead. You're washed, um, and you're wrapped in a white sheet, and you're carried on a litter that often has a, a covering over it and fabric inscribed with the Quran. You're taken to the graveyard, a hole is dug, your body in the sheet is put directly into the ground. The whole idea is the body's supposed to go back. It's supposed to decay. It's, now, and that has to do not only with sort of returning to the earth, but the idea of, of idolatry in certain societies here in Arabia and throughout the entire Middle East, the idea of even putting a headstone is a really bad thing because you'll remember that person and there might be a cult around that person. Or the, or the idea is that person's gone, they're gone. Uh, but there's a lot of variation. For example, in Salalah, up in the hills, there's the famous tomb, tomb of Job, which is a shrine with this big tomb with this beautiful green velvet that's embroidered with Islamic calligraphy and it's a point of pilgrimage and it supposedly is the tomb of Job, the burial place of Job. There's another burial place which is hilarious. It's this really long, 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 long tomb that I forget who's supposed to be dedicated to, but some giant and a saint. So that's, in this society, that's okay. And there are, as I mentioned earlier, there is marabouts, the little shrines with the little domes. Those are dedicated to holy men. So this society is quite accepting of it. And we, we drove, some of us noticed we drove by a, a graveyard, which was just a big a gravel, you know, it was a gravelly hill, and you could see little upright stones, just very rough stones. Though That is a normal graveyard. So in Oman, they're, they're quite flexible about this. In Saudi Arabia, it is forbidden to mark graves, basically. You cannot mark graves. And the Wahhabis, the, uh, the Muslims in uh, Saudi Arabia who are so very, very strict because this whole idea of idolatry, you should only be thinking about the Prophet Muhammad. Um, over the years, they have destroyed historical monuments, which didn't go down a lot very well with other people. For example, as I mentioned to some of you, they recently bulldozed the so-called uh, Tomb of Eve, which was not too far from, um, from, uh, from Jeddah. So, and then you go to Turkey. How many of you have gone to Turkey and seen the spectacular graveyards there with the beautiful big carved monuments with admirals, fezes, and turbans and stuff? So it's definitely not a... And, and then Egypt, some, when you go to downtown Cairo, some of the huge mosques, they're tombs, tombs of famous sultans. So it, it's very interesting. It varies tremendously from one country to another. And Oman's kind of related. You have a question now? Um, um, interesting point. Um, the tour guide said that everybody gets a land grant when they're 24 or 25, something like that. Um, I'm not aware of that. Um, and the question was if women get that too. I says, I don't know, but that's, that's an interesting point and it doesn't surprise me at all. Because there's a lot of, uh, did, you, uh, did you know something more about this? Yeah, our, our guide said that everyone gets one land grant. It's now extended to women as well. I'm sorry. Our guide said that women get as well. Recently. That's a recent <laughs> Because probably because they're Omanis, again, trying to support. Yeah, because I was wondering what's going on because you think about some of these other oil rich countries that that the citizens, the citizens, get you know payments. They're they're actually sharing in, in the oil wealth. So I wasn't aware of that, and that makes that makes a lot of sense because again, trying to get Omanis to stay in Oman would be one of the goals. But it's very I just remember that. 
one more cake. When you took tours around the Middle East, places like Oman, I read in your thing that you've done this for years, were they groups of tours or were they scholars or tell but, us about that. Um, my career in tourism here was taking people like you. Yeah. Um, and it would usually be like a land program for like two weeks, something like that. And I tell you, those programs are pretty hard to sell these days. But they were wonderful. They were just wonderful. Like two and a half weeks in Yemen, where you'd see everything. I was lucky enough to do a, a two and a half week pro program in Saudi Arabia, which was pretty tough um, to get permission to do that. But it was very interesting. Very, very. So, um, and there still is, if you look at, I mean, there are still companies to do that, that do that, you know, but it's, it's a limited market, and so there are not many companies that do it. But it's, it's a, you know, it's a great experience. But obviously right now, the political situation is, is not very good. For example, you know, forget going to Yemen, forget going to Syria. You know, it's, it's sad. But thank you very much.